Hello and welcome back to Really Old News, the most esteemed archaeology news series on YouTube. Today I'll be going over a ton of fascinating recent discoveries announced in the past couple of weeks, including a truly remarkable number of fascinating Roman and Egyptian finds, as well as a wild card we'll cover at the very end. But first, remember to subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. But without further ado, here's the news. A Roman glass bowl in absolutely pristine condition was recently found in the city of Nijmegen in the Netherlands. It was found during excavations conducted at the site of a housing development in the Winkelsteg area of Nijmegen. The Dutch city of Nijmegen began life as the Roman city of Noviomagus and was established in the 1st century AD. It was also the first municipium in the Netherlands, a high honor given that, as a result, its denizens gained Roman citizenship. The bowl is at least 1,800 years old, and yet it's in flawless condition without even a single chip or crack. I mean, can you believe that? That's crazy. The bowl may have been manufactured at nearby Xantin, or Vitera, in Germany, which was known for its glass manufacturing, or even the heart of the empire, Italy. In any case, it was made by making molten glass cool in a mold. Its crisp blue pigmentation comes from some metal oxide that was added to it, and the striping you see here was drawn in when the glass was still molten. The excavations that yielded this bowl have also yielded Roman graves and the grave goods placed within them. In addition, although not much of ancient Nijmegen's wooden dwellings have survived, the residue from them and soil discoloration have allowed the excavators to map out what the area would have looked like in antiquity. Now on to our next story, which also takes place in the former territories of the Western Roman Empire. A previously unknown Roman amphitheater has been unearthed in Switzerland. At Kaiseraugst on the Rhine near Basel, Switzerland, the amphitheater's walls were stumbled upon during the construction of a boathouse for the Basel Rowing Club. Argau Canton archaeologists began excavating the site last December, and although they initially expected to find an abandoned Roman quarry, they actually found a, a 165 feet or 50 meter long uh, and 130 feet or 40 meter wide oval ring, telltale traces of a Roman amphitheater. The south side features three entrances, one big one flanked by two smaller ones, and there was once a large sandstone gate at its western side. Additionally, some plaster is still left on the interior side of the amphitheater's walls. Impressions made by wooden posts are the only traces of the amphitheater's original wooden bleachers. This is where the spectators who came there would have seen gladiatorial fights and beast hunts. These spectators probably came from the nearby Roman castrum or fortress known as Castrum Roricens, or the nearby city of Augusta Rorica, which featured yet another amphitheater. The fort was built around 300 AD when the Roman frontier in the region shrank, which suggests that the recently discovered amphitheater is actually the newest Roman amphitheater in all of Switzerland. The boathouse of the Basel Rowing Club, which started this all, will incorporate the amphitheater into its design. In other news, part of a new Venus statue has been found in Zadar, Croatia. The marble statue was found six feet below the town's modern surface during excavations conducted at the future site of a hotel. You can see that the statue broke apart, and that the fragment of it that's been discovered only comprises the statue's knees to its waist, as well as a little chunk of a hand on its left thigh. The fragment is three feet tall, so the statue it came from was likely over six feet tall. It's thought to date to the second century. The statue was found amidst the ruins of an urban villa belonging to one of ancient Zadar's wealthier residents, and so far 850 square feet of the structure's marble flooring has been excavated, although more of it actually lies beyond the scope of the excavations that uncovered it. This villa would have sat just a few hundred meters from the town center, its forum. This, vi this villa and another one right next to it were actually first discovered 60 years ago by Professor Boris Ilakovac, which goes to show that archaeological sites aren't too keen on giving up all their secrets all at once. This villa also featured a wall lined with grey marble tiles, the remains of a 4 square meter or 43 square foot black and white mosaic, and a 36 foot long or 11 meter 
Long drainage canal. It's thought that the statue of Venus was once one of several statues adorning the home's atrium, and it's been proposed that the little piece of a hand on Venus's left thigh may have belonged to a statue of Mercury that would have been paired with the goddess's statue. The villa was probably demolished in the early Middle Ages, but the site would continue to be used as several medieval walls were discovered during excavations there. If you're wondering where you might be able to see the Venus statue, it's been transferred to the depot of Croatia's home. Homeland Museum in Biograd Namoru, although I don't know when or if it'll be displayed to the public. I know we've been heading south throughout this video, so let's continue on that trajectory by covering three truly intriguing discoveries recently made in the land of the pharaohs, Egypt. A pair of colossal limestone sphinxes have recently been found at the site of the powerful 18th dynasty pharaoh Amenhotep III's mortuary temple on the west bank of Thebes. There's not much of this once truly magnificent temple left, but it did once host the famous Colossi of Memnon. And of course, now we know that it also featured these two exquisite sphinxes, and more, as we'll find out. These sphinxes, which are both around 26 feet or 7 meters long, were found half-submerged in water by a German-Egyptian team of researchers led by Egyptologist Horik Zeruzian, as part of a conservation project meant to restore what's left of the mortuary temple that was begun back in 1998. The sphinxes were found at the rear of the gateway of the third pylon of the temple. In addition, three fragmentary statues of the fierce lion-headed goddess Sekhmet and remains of a grand pillared hall decorated with reliefs depicting the Hebsed festival, which celebrated the pharaoh's ritual renewal, have also been discovered. These sandstone reliefs depict part of the Hebsed festivities and the king offering to a diverse array of deities. A nice little Granodiorite statue of an official with his wife, made sometime after the Amarna period, was also discovered, which means that it was set up in the temple decades after Amenhotep III's passing. These discoveries were announced by Egypt's Ministry of Antiquities on January the 13th, and I just have to add that something hilarious about the mainstream media's treatment of this story is that they refer to the Nemes headdress, which the sphinxes are wearing, as mongoose-shaped headdresses, which I'm guessing is a translation error they all took from the original announcement. The sphinxes and the fragmentary statues of Sekhmet will be put back will be put back together and displayed at the site of the temple, and I'm betting the other material is going to be put into storage. A large tomb containing 20 Greco-Roman mummies was just found in an ancient necropolis near Aswan. The discovery was made by a joint Italian-Egyptian expedition under the auspices of the State University of Milan and Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities. It was directed by Professor Patrizia Piacentini and Abdelmonem Said, the Director General of Aswan and Nubia Antiquities. They were excavating the necropolis surrounding the Aga Khan III mausoleum, which, which was used by Aswan's ancient in inhabitants from the 6th century BC to the 4th century AD. So quite a long time. The large tomb, which they actually found between May and October of last year, has been dubbed AGH-032. It was plundered in antiquity, but it still contained 20 mummies that were interred there between the 1st century BC, when Egypt was still ruled by the Ptolemies, and the 2nd or 3rd centuries AD, when Egypt was an integral part of the Roman Empire. So there's a very, very slight chance that one of those mummies happened to see that Venus statue we were just talking about, eh? The tomb was originally obscured by a rectangular sandstone structure that showed signs of having been burnt. Near the building's eastern wall, a mummy with a copper necklace featuring a plaque inscribed with the Greek name Nikostratos was found. This mummy, Nikostratos, was probably removed from the nearby tomb by looters. In addition, a heap containing animal bones, mainly belonging to sheep, pottery sherds, and slabs inscribed in hieroglyphs covered the east wall of the structure. These were probably votive offerings, and this points to the building being a chapel dedicated to the locally significant god Knum. In addition, an offering table was found near the tomb's entrance. The entrance of the tomb consists of a staircase covered by a vault. A terracotta sarcophagus containing the mummy of a child met the researchers at the bottom of these stairs. The tomb consists of four burial chambers cut into the bedrock of the necropolis, filled with mummies, wrapped in linen and covered in a paper mache like a paper mache like material. Some of these mummies had their wrappings and, and cartonages slashed by ancient thieves. Amazingly, a knife was found amongst the mummies that likely made those very slashes. Ain't that bizarre? 
The mummies belong to people from all age groups, ranging from an infant to the elderly, whose bones showed traces of arthritis. And they probably came from multiple different families. Remains of a unique 225 square meter or 2,421 square foot mining headquarters repeatedly used over the course of Egyptian history have recently been unearthed at the site of Wadi al Nasb in southern Sinai, where which the ancient Egyptians sent expeditions to in order to mine the copper and turquoise there. It was discovered by the first Egyptian archaeological mission to enter South Sinai since it was reabsorbed by Egypt after the departure of Israeli forces in 1982. This archaeological mission started excavating Wadi al-Nasb, which is six kilometers from the more well-known temple site of Sarabit al-Qadim, last November. It's also the first archaeological mission to have ever been conducted at Wadi al-Nasb, and it was headed by Mustafa Nur al-Din. This unique... St this unique sandstone edifice was first built during the Middle Kingdom, Egypt's second golden age, and was subsequently reused with little changes to its interior during the New Kingdom, when Egypt was at the height of its power. It was also used way, way after that in the 6th century BC and during the late Roman period. It ended its life as a copper workshop, resulting in the top stratigraphic layers there, yielding furnaces, copper ore, ingots, crucibles, and slag. The four copper ingots found weighed up to three pounds. Three copper extraction caves were also found within the vicinity of the building. The structure sits at the center of the site and overlooks the wells that once supplied the ancient miners that once supplied the ancient miners with water. It consisted of two main halls, which were later further subdivided by walls installed during the Roman period, another two rooms, one used as a workshop for processing turquoise, and a staircase to the roof. Its floor is lined with sandstone slabs, and it's the largest Egyptian smelting site in the Sinai, and is estimated to have produced 100,000 tons of copper slag. And look forward to seeing more discoveries just like this one in the news because the excavation conducted at Wadi al Nasp is part of a project which involves the excavation and restoration of five archaeological sites in northern Sinai and five others in southern Sinai. Now on to our last story, the identification of some of the world's oldest drinking straws. These stunningly beautiful objects come from an early Bronze Age burial mound near Mykop in southern Russia known as the Mykop Kurgan, and they were actually discovered 125 years ago in 1897. The Mykop Kurgan is so important that it became the namesake of an entire culture, the creatively named Mykop Early Bronze Age Culture, which existed from 3700 BC to 3000 or 2900 BC. Long silver and gold tubes were found placed to the immediate right-hand side of the skeleton of the supposed priest-king occupying the mound's main chamber, while the rest of the grave goods in it were arranged along the chamber's walls. These tubes, which are now housed in the Hermitage Museum, were originally identified as scepters by the man who excavated the mound, Professor Nikolai Veselovsky of St. Petersburg University. But new research suggests that the, they may have actually been some of the world's oldest and certainly the world's fanciest drinking straws. This study was conducted by the Institute for the History of Material Culture, a, a part of the Russian Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg, and was published in a freely accessible article in the journal Antiquity on January 19th. I've linked it in the description in case you want to check it out. The eight tubes, which all have narrow, perforated tips, are each over a meter in length. Four of them, two gold ones and two silver ones, were attached to figurines of aurochs, the ancient ancestor of modern cattle. These aurochs figurines seem to be some of the most famous works of art ever produced by the Mykop culture. Barley starch granules have recently been found on the inner surface of these tubes, which suggests that they were used as straws for drinking beer from a communal vessel. Similar straws were used to drink beer in both Mesopotamia and Egypt. In fact, a popular motif in Mesopotamian art from the 3rd millennium BC features banqueting scenes showing groups of people sipping beer through long tubes from a shared vessel. Sumerian straws, which were made of reed stems, are especially similar to the ones found at the Mykop Kurgan, in that they both feature metal strainers used to filter out impurities, and Sumerian straws were also sometimes adorned with depictions of animals. Additionally, straws from the burial of the Sumerian queen Puabi are also made of gold and silver, but also lapis lazuli, too. Therefore, the straws found in the Kurgan were probably there because the people of the Mykop culture had a taste for Sumerian culture.
But sadly, these aren't actually the oldest known drinking straws. The earliest depictions of drinking str through a straw come from seal impressions found at Chalcolithic sites dating to the 5th and 4th millenniums BC, Gora 12 in northern Iraq, and Choga Mish in western Iran. Thank you so much for watching, and make sure to stay tuned for even more really old news in the next couple of weeks. See ya!